Hello and welcome to uh, day two of the Sim Center training for QuoFem. Uh, today we're discussing more advanced topics and hosting office hours uh, for questions and answers uh, with the audience uh, here today. We've started this morning uh, with a similar audience of primarily graduate students uh, who have uh, interest or background in structural engineering uh, and earthquake engineering, but we're also um, joined with uh, members who are interested in geotechnical engineering and uh, uh, wind and water uh, related hazards from hurricanes. And we're now asking attendees, um, how long does it take to run a typical simulation um, within, within their respected field? And in addition to that, how many input parameters, how many random variables are you interested in in these simulations? And the third question is how many outputs, how many uh, quantities of interest are you typically um, including in your simulations when you're interested in uncertainty quantification? And it looks like uh, we're almost have uh, almost all the attendees have responded. I'll give you those of you who are trying to finish up those three questions, just another minute to answer. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and, and share these results. So a typical simulation uh, from the audience here takes several minutes. 55% uh, of the attendees said several minutes. 10% um, said they take several seconds and another 10% said several hours. 20% of you have said your simulations take several days to run. And the next question of how many input parameters, how many random variables are you typically considering in your simulations? Uh, a quarter of the attendees have said between one and five. 35% of the attendees said between six and 20 random variables. 10% said more than 20 random variables. And a quarter of the attendees said time series or field data. And just 5% of people said that this is not applicable to what they're currently, uh, their current simulations in, include. And the last question of how many outputs or quantities of interest are you considering? 35% uh, of attendees said between one and five. 20% of attendees said between six and 20, and 25% said more than 20 quantities of interest, while 15% of attendees said they are interested in time series or field data as quantities of interest. So thank you for those responses. Um, I'm gonna remind attendees that uh, we'll use the chat window for questions. If you have a question for the presenters today, uh, please send them uh, to us in the chat. Uh, you can uh, send it to everyone uh, because we have some of the Sim Center development team uh, here to answer questions as well. Um, I'm going to stop sharing the poll and uh, I'll uh, reintroduce Akash. Akash is a postdoctoral scholar uh, at UC Berkeley. Uh, he and Song Ri are the lead developers for the QuoFem application. And uh, Akash, uh, thank you for the presentations yesterday and uh, thank you for, for being here this morning. Great, thanks a lot, Matt. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, hello all, uh, welcome to day two of the COFEM tool training workshop. Uh, Sangri and I will go over uh, some advanced features today and we'll also discuss COFEM's uh, backend workflow. Uh, I'm Akash. Um, so before we get into today's topics, just a brief recap of some important information. Um, these slides are available at the Design Safety Eyes uh, page. Um, and uh, if you have not uh, yet installed COFEM, so the guide, the setup guide, the links are also available on the slide. Uh, and you can download COFEM from the Design Safety Eyes web page. Uh, within COFEM, um, the help menu contains links to the user manual as well as um, to the Sim Center forum, um, where you can report any bugs you come across or you can make feature requests. Um, and COFEM also has a number of examples available from the examples menu, which can be loaded uh, by going on, by clicking on the required example in the examples menu. 
uh, by doing so by clicking on this example all the fields required to run that example get auto populated in the coupon panel and uh, this is just an overview of all the analysis options available in coupon um, out of these yesterday we covered the global sensitivity analysis and the tmcmc engine uh, today we will continue uh, with some examples of calibration uh, and i'll discuss how to use the dakota engine to do parameter estimation and bayesian calibration using the same example which was used for tmcmc yesterday um, and um, that will be the first topic which we'll cover today after that uh, we'll present another example which is a bayesian calibration of a material model in coupon using experimental data and in this example the response quantity is the time history of the stress response so this is a different uh, it's a new feature where we can handle uh, non scalar or the vector uh, response quantity i'll then I'll, i will then describe the default covariance structure of the errors or the residuals using um, bayesian calibration within coupon and i'll show how users can override the default options and supply other error covariance structures uh, next i'll show how to provide a custom log likelihood function in tmcmc and after that sangvi will go over the back end in coupon uh, which will help users to troubleshoot their uq analyses and also to show how to extend coupon implementation um as we also discussed yesterday um there are three options in coupon for running calibration workflows um two of these use the dakota uq engine and the third option uses the ucsd uq engine uh, in yesterday session we showed an example of how to run a bayesian calibration example using tmcmc uh, as the poll showed yesterday most of the attendees are new to coupon uh, so today we'll briefly discuss how to use the calibration options in the dakota uq engine to solve um, the same system identification problem um and in all of these calibration workflows there are essentially four components uh, which define the problem we need to provide the data uh, which is used for calibration uh, that is done within the uq panel um the model is defined in the fpm panel the inputs are uh, defined in the rb panel and outputs are in the qi panel of coupon um just a quick recap of the example 2 um we want uh in this we are considering a two story building structure and the response of this structure along the x direction is being modeled um the it the structure is modeled as a uh, two story 2d shear building in open sea the idealizations made and all the constraints being applied are shown here and in the end there are only two degrees of freedom uh hence there are two natural modes of vibration and by doing modal analysis the we can obtain uh, the eigen values and eigen vectors um now this is for a model but for a real structural system there are parameters of this fe model whose values are unknown and we wish to estimate these unknown parameter values using some measurement data um a set of measurement data is being simulated by adding uh, gaussian noise to the eigen values and eigen vectors from the first mode in yesterday session we treated the story stiffnesses these quantities k1 and k2 uh, as unknown and we used these measurement data to estimate the values of k1 and k2 in today's example we'll do a slightly different version of the same problem where we are treating the moment of inertia of the columns of the story 1 and story 2 as unknowns and we'll use the same data to um, estimate these values so the way the model uh, inputs and outputs are defined are now shown in this slide um we see that the model script essentially consists of four parts in the first part and the i we have defined the input random variable um or in the case of deterministic calibration these are called design variables instead of random variables um and the rest of the the script uh contains commands to build the model and these are commands to define the analysis and in the end uh, these are the, the commands uh these are the commands for writing the output to file uh 
uh, two important things to keep in mind is that um, we need to use the preset keyword in order to uh, interface our model scripts with Cofen. And also the outputs must be result written to a file called results.out. Uh, so this script will be used for today's example, for today's demonstration. Um, and on this slide, uh, I show how to set up the problem uh, to run using the dream algorithm, which is uh, available under the Dakota UQ engine. So on this page, this is the set of calibration data, which is provided as a calibration data file. Um, and the, uh, the RV panel, uh, is where we define the random variables which we want to estimate. Uh, so in this case, we are defining the column stiffnesses, I, I C one, the column moments of inertia as the uh, unknown random variables whose value we need to calibrate. The quantities of interest are again, the eigen value and the eigen, uh, the second component of the first eigen vector, uh, which are returned from the analysis. On this pane, we show the results obtained after defining the problem and running uh, the problem using uh, COFIN. Um, one thing to observe here is that the number of calibration parameters is not just equal to the number of RVs which we have defined, but it, there are some additional calibration parameters. Uh, and there is one additional calib calibration parameter per response quantity. So in all of our Bayesian inference problems, uh, the total number of calibration parameters is equal to the number of RVs plus the number of quantities of interest. And what is this additional calibration parameter will be explained uh, later. Um, as we see, so we, if we go to the data values uh, tab within the results pane, uh, we can, uh, the, all the resulting posterior samples uh, along with um, the response quantities uh, are presented in uh, a spreadsheet. By clicking on the columns, we can view um, the entire set of samples for each of these uh, quantities. And uh, we, so for this problem, um, there was no burn-in which was defined, uh, which is one of the parameters which has to be defined in the dream. So um, we just see what is going on um, when we do not define any burn-in period. Um, so we see that initially sampling uh, happens, so sampling starts from the prior probability distributions. Uh, and as the Markov chains uh, are propagated, so it takes some time for uh, the Markov chains to start sampling effectively from the posterior probability distribution, which is our target distribution. Uh, so users need to keep in mind to define sufficient number of samples for burn-in and we should only discard the samples which are in the burn-in stage so that we uh, effectively estimate our statistics from the posterior probability distribution. Uh, it is not easy to say for a problem how many burn-in samples must be used or how long the chain is run. Um, so the, but the users can visualize the results and then they can do further post-processing by saving the data from uh, the analysis in COSA. Now, this example can be loaded from the example menu. Um, and also, we also provide an example for doing deterministic calibration, uh, which we'll discuss next. So the param deterministic calibration is called parameter estimation in COFIN. It is available under the Dakota UQ engine. And there are five methods and parameter estimation is one of those methods, um, one of the categories of methods. Within the parameter estimation, there are two algorithms. Um, and these two algorithms are specialized algorithms for solving nonlinear least squares minimization problems. Um, in, in these algorithms compute the residuals and the gradient of the residuals, and they approximate the Hessian. Uh, both of these algorithms are uh, gradient-based local minimization algorithms. Uh, and they are based on the Gauss-Newton approximation uh, to the Hessian. Um, so this makes use of the special structure of the nonlinear least squares minimization problem. Um, the objective function for this is the sum of squared errors. So the structure of that is exploited 
in order to approximate the Hessian by using only the gradient and the residual values. Uh, whereas in a general optimization uh, problem, Newton's method is preferred for doing local uh, minimization. Um, but this, the Newton's algorithm would need the function value, the gradient and the Hessian to be evaluated at every step. So for, uh, and, but for convex optimization domains, this, uh, the Newton's algorithm is guaranteed to converge to the local minimum and the rate of convergence is also is quadratic. But in most practical cases, evaluating the gradient and Hessian has to be done numerically uh, using finite different schemes. So that would involve running uh, several model evaluations at each step um, and accurately calculating the gradient and Hessian is also pretty hard um, to do so numerically. So that is why these specialized algorithms have been implemented, which uh, do not need the Hessian to be evaluated, but they only rely on uh, computations of the gradient. Uh, but there is a caveat, these algorithms will work well when the model can fit the data well. That is when the residuals are small uh, near the optimum value. Only in these cases, um, these specialized algorithms perform well for doing parameter estimation. Um, and uh, looking at the RV panel, we see that the type of variable is a continuous design variable. This is an optimization problem. So we define the lower and upper bounds for each uh, parameter. And uh, we also define a starting point from where the algorithm will begin its search for the optimum. Um, so in, in the current formulation can be extended in many directions. For example, uh, we do not allow constraints to be specified. So that is a potential um, uh, extension of the current uh, implementation in COFAN. Uh, also, we do not uh, support general optimization algorithms, for example, like the uh, Newton uh, approximation, uh, Newton algorithm, uh, or uh, uh, so we, we, those are again another direction where we can extend our current formulations. We can implement several uh, general purpose uh, optimization algorithms, which could be gradient based or uh, algorithms for global optimization. Um, and we can also support multi-objective optimization if users are interested. So if you're interested in any, any of these features, please make a feature request and we'll respond to your request. Um, so that was an overview of uh, how to use the Quota engine to do calibration. Now we'll move on to today's uh, new example, which is based on calibration of the material model. Um, and we'll use TMCMC to solve uh, this problem. Um, and we will actually be using experimental data uh, for this problem. So here our objective is to calibrate the material model parameters using experimental cyclic stress strain data. This data is, uh, was first reported in the paper referenced below and the data is made available to us courtesy of Professor Joel P. Conte from UCSD. Um, instead of a traditional sawtooth shape strain history, randomized strain history similar to those which are observed experimentally in reinforcing steel during seismic tests were preferred for conducting the test. Um, so this material coupons, test coupons were subjected to this strain history and the resulting stress response was recorded. So this is the data which is available to us. And the material model used to represent this data is the GMP model, which is known as steel zero to in open sea. Uh, by uh, so open uh, the steel zero two model has uh, can represent a wide range of behaviors depending on the parameters uh, chosen for uh, this material model. Uh, so we need to uh, our objective is now to calibrate the parameters of this material model uh, so that we can get a good match between our model predictions and the experimental data. So in this problem, our data or the response quantity is the stress time history, so the time history of the stress. So the blue points show the data and the red is our prediction from the model. This is plotted after uh, at the posterior mean of the uh, obtained from doing Bayesian calibration. Now, in order to load this example, we can do so by going to the examples menu and this, this example is called the material model based in calibration with TMCMC. 
when that example file is loaded, it will auto populate all the fields. So the calibration data file for this case uh, is shown here. Um, so we have data from only one experiment in this case. So there is only one line of entries in this calibration data file. Um, but this has a length of 342, which is uh, the number of data points available from that experiment. Uh, we'll then define the input script. Uh, this input uh, script performs a material um, test. That means it subjects the material uh, to the strain history and uh, returns the stress history as the output. And in the RV panel, we define the parameters of the model which we want to calibrate. And we define a prior probability density for all of these parameters. Um, so once you define a PDF, uh, by clicking on the button called show PDF, it, we can actually see what is the PDF that you defined. In this case, it's not very interesting. It's just a uniform distribution between zero and 0 0.2. Um, and if you, in the QOI panel, now we have defined the stress as the variable name. Uh, now, uh, an interesting thing to observe is that the stress uh, is not a scalar, so it is a vector whose length is 342. After defining the problem, we run the analysis and these are uh, the results which were obtained. Um, so we see that there are seven uh, parameters which are being calibrated. In addition to that, there is one more uh, parameter which is calibrated, uh, which corresponds to uh, the one QI which we defined uh, in our problem. And by clicking on the data values tab within the results panel, you can see the uh, samples obtained from TMCMC. One thing which we can observe here is that there is no burn-in period um, because these are all samples which are coming from the posterior. Uh, and in TMCMC, uh, the sampling uh, starts from the prior and it progresses to sampling from the posterior in a number of stages. All the samples from the intermediate stages are discarded, so only the samples from the posterior are available in uh, when uh, on when we load the results. Uh, I, I will skip the demo in, in the interest of time, so the users can run the example on their own by loading the uh, example from the menu. So next we will see what is the default covariance structure assumed for the error terms or the residual terms in uh, base in calibration, uh, and also options to override these default uh, error covariance structure. To do that, just a quick recap of uh, base in calibration. So consider the setting for base in calibration. In this, we have our forward model, which maps the inputs to the outputs. Um, in base and calibration, our belief about uh, the values of the inputs based on any prior knowledge is called the prior probability distribution. And now when we observe some data, which is a realization of the quantities of interest, uh, we will then update our belief about the priors um, by using base theorem. And in order to do so, we need to compute the likelihood uh, that a particular input value produced the observed data. So we'll now need to look at the details of computing the likelihood. Um, so we have seen that in a calibration problem in COFIN, there are these four parts. Um, by denoting the data as T, the model as N, and the inputs as theta, the outputs are uh, returned uh, from the model at for that particular value of input theta. Now, we obtain the errors or the residuals as the difference between the predictions from the model and the calibration data. So this R of theta can be thought of as a vector. Um, and the length of this vector, denoted as n here, is the number of experiments times the sum of the lengths of each of the quantities of interest uh, in our problem. So for example, in the first in the first example, which I discussed today, there were two quantities of interest. Each of those were scalars. So the length of each of those quantities of interest was one, but we had data from five experiments. Um, so the total number of residual terms 
is it or is equal to the number of total number of calibration turns in the calibration data file. Uh, so in this case, the length of the residual vector is 10. And in the second example, the material model calibration, we only have data from one experiment, but it was of length 342. So the, our residuals are a vector whose total length uh, is equal to the number of calibration terms that we specified. Uh, and in Bayes' theorem, we start off with a prior probability distribution on our parameters, which is multiplied by the likelihood to obtain the posterior probability distribution. Now, the likelihood is a function of our residual, which are shown here. Um, and then it is usually convenient to work with the log likelihood for numerical purposes. Uh, so if we assume that all the residuals have a Gaussian distribution, and the covariance between the i -th and the j -th term between the residuals is represented by a covariance matrix. The size of this matrix will be n times n. Um, and the log likelihood in this case is uh, as shown in the expression. Now we will explain the default assumptions of the log likelihood structure by using an example. In this example, we have five quantities of interest, five response quantities, and we have data from two experiments. So the default structure for the error covariance is assumed to be block diagonal. And this error covariance is of the matrix is of the size n by n. Um, and if our response quantity is a scalar, then we will assume a scalar variance value as the default. Uh, but if it is a vector response quantity, then we will assume a scalar matrix. So in this example, Q1 and Q2 are scalar response quantities. So we will use a scalar uh, variance values uh, in, the, in this component of the block diagonal matrix. Uh, and for uh, the Q3, Q4, and Q5 are uh, vector response quantities. And for this, the default assumption is a scalar matrix. That is a scalar value times the identity matrix. Uh, so what is the scalar value uh, which is used by default? Um, so in order to obtain this value, we first perform a scaling of the calibration data. Um, the calibration data of each response quantity is scaled by its absolute maximum value. Then the variance of the scaled data is computed per response quantity. And that value is used as the default uh, scalar error variance for scalar response and as uh, the scalar value, uh, which is multiplying the identity matrix for a response quantity. So this is the default error covariance structure, which is assumed in basin calibration in COFAN. But now if we want to override the defaults, we can supply the error covariance matrix, uh, or we can supply each component of this block diagonal matrix that means we can specify error covariance matrix per response per experiment. This is done so by providing these uh, error covariance structures within files uh, whose name follows this particular convention. So it has to follow the convention called response variable uh, name dot experiment number dot sigma. So in this case, this is demonstrated by an example. So if you want to override the covariance uh, value which is assumed, the variance value which is assumed for Q1 from experiment one, you need to provide that information in this file called Q1.1.sigma. You don't need to provide um, all of these files. So you can just provide the component of the covariance structure which you want to override the default value, the default assumption. Now within these user supplied covariance files, the following options are supported. For a scalar response quantity, you can pass in a scalar variance value, one a single value within that file. Uh, or for a vector response quantity, you can either pass in a scalar variance value. In this case, the block diagonal matrix is identity times this value. Or you can supply a diagonal covariance matrix where each component has a different variance value. Uh, essentially, each component of that vector has a different variance or you can supply a full co covariance matrix where there will be co covariances between um, any set, any pair of uh, residual quantities. So this is how you can override the default uh, assumptions in COFIN. 
Now, finally, coming to what are these additional response, uh, param additional parameters which are calibrated. Um, so since we have used some default assumptions or since the users can override those default assumptions, but until we calibrate the model, we would not know what is the uh, residual or the error. Uh, so that is why uh, instead of just using a constant value, we are calibrating a value of multipliers on these quantities per response quantity. Uh, so the number of calibration parameters is equal to the number of random variables plus the number of QIs. Now the same value of this multiplier is used on the error covariance per response across the ex experiments. Um, yeah, so that is how uh, you can override the default option, error covariance options. Now, uh, my last topic for today is how to provide a custom log likelihood function in TMCMC. Uh, we saw that the default assumption was a Gaussian covariance matrix, but if the users want to override uh, all of the log likelihood uh, assumptions made in TMCMC, they can do so by providing their own log likelihood function. Um, this log likelihood function is called by passing all of these arguments. The details of that are explained uh, in the slide. Um, so if you want to override the default log likelihood function, you can do so by uh, passing in a Python script, which contains a function called log likelihood, and it should accept all of these arguments. Now, all of these arguments need not be used in your uh, log likelihood function. And this slide shows an example of such a, a function where we are using this multimodal function as the log likelihood, uh, as the likelihood function. Um, so that function is defined here. It accepts all of these arguments, but it only returns the negative of the log of this function as the log likelihood value. And uh, when TMCMC was run by using this log likelihood, these were the results that were obtained. Um, so you can override the default error covariance structures as well as you can override the log likelihood function itself. Uh, so that brings me to the end of my portion of today's talk. Um, now I'll hand it over to Sangri to continue discussing about tokens backend. Stop my share. Thank you, Akash. Um, hello, I'm Sangri. Today, I want to talk about um, Sim Center backend part, like Coffin backend part. Um, so CoFM consists of two parts that are front-end and back-end. Front-end is a part that we, we uh, user provides input entry and back-end is the, where it analysis actually performs. So in the front-end, um, all the input we provided are saved as a single file, which we call it Dakota.json. So JSON file format is standard, open standard file format for um, data communication. So as you can see it here, it's um, re in readable file format. So all the information you provide to CoFM will be included in this single text file. And then backend use this file to run analysis. So what backend does is we, we like to um, represent our backend workflow using these puzzle pieces. So for whatever engines user selects, we launch preprocessor and postprocessor and glue them together to make a whole workflow. But in CoFM, it is most general tool, so it has most simple puzzle forms that consists of only UQ and FEM engines. So each time UQ and FEM engine communicates, they um, leave trails. So those um, input script output data are all stored in your local directories. And it is sometimes inspect to these um, logs because like mostly for to to um, troubleshoot when your simulation fails 
or even though even when simulation was successful, you might want to inspect, inspect the details of simulations. Moreover, since you are in the research field, if you are more into UQ, you might want to gain more control over UQ engines beyond user interface. And for the quota, this is um, can be done by modifying the like backend files. And also when you want to plug in custom UQ and custom FEM engines, then you might want to understand how backend or flow works. So where are these all um, files saved? If you go to preference in CoFM, there is a directory called local jobs directory. So um, all the files will be saved in this directory. And this is the figure, like review of how a backend works um, on the surface of CoFM. Um, this is actually from Frank's slide. So um, as when we click the run button, it reads a file called workflow applications. This is just the map that indicates where our UQ processor locates. And then it creates the folder to save all the outputs. And then it writes this Dakota.json I just showed. And it launches UQ processor. And then what UQ processor does is to write input script for UQ application and actually launch UQ application. Here, uh, another file called workflow driver is generated. And this is um, nothing but the pre and post process scripts that can um, to connect FEM to UQ application. So when UQ application runs, it calls FEM application number of times and each time FEM application is called, it generates a new folder to save all the um, resulting outputs. And once UQ application finishes its job, it writes UQ output file and it notifies to UQ processor. And UQ processor will tell CoFM to read the output and display the result. So there are a number of like products, um, like output files written during this process. And this shows the example. So this is example of Dakota engine. If you go to local work directory, you can see that Dakota input file and Dakota output files are generated. And even more, if you want to like inspect each samples individually, for example, if you want to see the sample in round number three, you can go into this working directory folder. And then what you will find is a copy of your input scripts and the parameter values provided by Dakota. And there will be some output files, if any, written during the FEM analysis. And then there is workflow driver that runs analysis based on these two files. Actually, you can also reproduce the simulation that were conducted in this folder by directly calling workflow driver in your command prompt. And especially for Dakota engine, I wanted to point out that um, since Dakota is an independent general purpose UQ application, um, the, the features we show in CoFM UI is not everything. So they had broader methods and options. Um, there are broader options they provide. So for example, so um, for example, in CoFM, we um, display like seven random variable choices, but actually in Dakota, they support like 18 random variable types. So if you want to use, for example, um, geometric random uh, probability distribution, then CoFM cannot um, produce input file for that. 
In that case, you might want to inspect the taco time to file directly, modify it, and then uh, run, the, run from the quota directly. So if you inspect the quota.input file, you will see that all these informations are from what you provided in CoFM. So here you will want to find the name of these three visions and maybe change it to the another one. So what we recommend for these kind of cases is that first, if there's some feature you want to um, use, then first check the quota manual if they have one and find the um, command line for that. And then you can run some new CoFM analysis that is very similar to what you want to do. And then you can go to local jobs directory, find dakota.in file, and modify the parts you want. This can be like advanced method for UK analysis or um, different distribution types as well. And then you can run dakota, this dakota.in file directly using dakota, using command, again, using command prompt. Here, this is the example of the command, like there's record Dakota and um, put Dakota in post script. Uh, but here, um, we think that you need to, instead of just putting Dakota here, um, you might need to put whole path of Dakota executable, which you can find in CoFM preference as well. Uh, one benefit of doing it this way is that um, you don't have to write this or input script and workflow driver from scratch. So CoFM creates input script and workflow driver for you, and you can like slightly modify it to fit better in your purpose. And the, another engine is SimCenter UQ engine. This is like Dakota, this is developed in Sim Center, and we also maintain this. So this engine is developed to fit in, uh, to respond to the needs in natural hazard applications. Therefore, we consider the extensibility and standardized interface when we develop. As one of these efforts, um, NATAF interface was implemented. This is um, nothing but to transform the physical variables which we define, which are defined by users to independent standard numerandum variables. So what we do is to first um, convert arbitrarily like um, the other distribution types provided by user into a standard like normal distributions and then decouple them to make them independent. And we can also do the, um, the other way around. One benefit of in involving this kind of transformation is that um, in UQ engine, we need to only deal with standard, uh, independent standard normal random variable space. And this provides number of benefit that comes from this um, normality. And also UQ developers, these only consider the case with standard number and the variable instead of considering all the different cases comes from different distributions. Also, since we um, had this on uh, the top interface for the samples generated by UQ arrives at FEM as a physical random variable. So FEM do not have to um, concern about this. And finally, there is UCSD engine. Currently, we support TMCMC algorithm using this engine. So what I wanted to point out here is that um, structure of UCSD engine backend is a sli slightly different, but it's very similar. So here, instead of work directory we had before, it has um, analysis directory. 
that contains all the information, but unlike previous two engines, which um, generate folders for each single simulation, it overrides um, the directory for uh, every iteration. However, instead, we do store the intermediate value in this um, another CSV file so that you can check later. Um, finally, I will talk really briefly about remote remote running, what happens when you click run at design bu save button. So there was another directory called remote jobs directory here. So this is used when you run analysis at design safe. So what it does is very similar. Coffin creates input files <coughs> and saves that remote jobs directory. And then it, this file is zipped and upload it to design safe and they we will run analysis here and when user want the file back it will download UK output to remote top to top directories and display a coffin so this folder is kind of <clears throat> this folder bridges all the data so all, all the data during communication should be um saved in these directories. So this is just a similar figure. Uh, when we run press run design save button, it uh, reads workflow applications which locate the UQ processor and create a folder to save all the information. And it also writes the quota.json file and it runs UQ processor. Until this, all the procedures are same as before, but here, when UQ processor runs, it writes input script, and instead of calling actual UQ application, it just notifies CoFM. And then CoFM will zip all the input files and send them to design save. And also it will launch the job. And then on the design save, your analysis will be run and um, you will, they will keep your result that out until you click get from design button. So when you click design save, get from design save button, it also creates the folder to get the result and it requests file to design save and then the file will be copied to your directory and it reads the directory and displays, display the results um, on the user interface. So this is what it works, how it works when you run in design say. Um, actually, this slide concludes the third training today. So um, thank you again for coming to this tra tra training and we are happy to address the results. Thank you, Songri. Uh, thank you, Akash, for your presentation as well. Um, these were incredibly informative. And we're going to, um, before we jump to questions, um, we're going to take another poll. Um, this is a question, uh, several questions about um, where you run your applications. So if you're running a simulation, uh, the first question is, are you most likely to run it on your local computer? Do you run it on a university? cluster, or if you're in industry, do you run it on a company cluster? Are you using cloud services? Are you using the Sim Center's uh, cyber infrastructure partner, DesignSafe, that uh, Song Ri just covered? The next question is, do you have a DesignSafe account? Uh, if you have a pre-existing TAC or Texas Advanced Computing Center, this counts as well. The third question is, how much does it cost to run simulations on Design Safe's high performance computing cluster? And the fourth, I have a lot of questions here for you. How many cores does your laptop or desktop have? The last, uh, not the last question, the next question is, how many cores can you use at Design Safe's Stampede 2 high performance computer? And the last question, is 
Whose allocation do you do you use when you're running Sim Center applications? So, um, for those of you who are uh, in the meeting, if you would go ahead and uh, answer those questions, there are a lot of them. Some of them are really tricky, so I'll give you time to to answer those. Um, we currently have 26% of the attendees who have voted, so we'll give you just a few more minutes. Um, Sungri and Akash, I don't see any new questions in the chat, so um, you're off the hook. I think you explained everything just perfectly. Um, I, I, I think those those charts, uh, Songri, about um, the workflow, both locally and then um, the running things at DesignSafe, those those are um, quite helpful in understanding where you might go to try to figure out where you're, <laughs> where a particular simulation uh, data is located or, or how to um, kind of track down where the data is actually stored. So thank you for those detailed explanations. Um, we are at 66%. So if you are still with us, uh, I'll give you another minute. There were lots of questions and I know that some of them are very tricky. So um, if you do have a question after you've finished uh, answering the poll, you can send that to us in the chat. And since we're at 71%, 76%. I'm going to give you just a few more seconds to, um, to answer before sharing these results. We do have, uh, while I cover these results, uh, we will have one more question for you after the, after the tool training. So um, don't get too bogged down by these polls. Okay, so I'm going to end the poll now um, and I'm going to share these, these results. The first question is, where are you most likely running your simulations? And 58% said that you are running them on your local computer, either a desktop or a laptop. 21% said university or com uh, company computer cluster. No one is running on cloud services. So these include AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, things like that. 21% said you're running simulations at DesignSafe. So that's, that's a good thing, especially if you're running some of those uh, simulations that take a lot longer, like we saw hours, days. Um, the next question is, do you have a design safe or TAC account? And 74% of attendees said that they do. So that's also a good thing. 5% said they don't remember. And 21% said that they uh, do not have a design safe or TAC account. The third question is how much does it cost to run simulations on Design Safe? And for those of you who are here, uh, this is a good trick question. 16% of people said that it costs less than 22 cents per node hour. And that is not the right answer. Uh, I'm glad that nobody said that it costs more than a dollar per node hour um, because this was a trick question that Fortunately, more than half of you got right. And the answer is that it's available at no cost for natural hazards researchers because of NSF funding. NSF has funded the NERI program, Natural Hazards Engineering Research Infrastructure, that has paid for your compute time at the supercomputer uh, that Design Safe uses. So that's a good thing. Um, for those of you who might have thought that you need to apply for funding in order to get these allocations, it's not true. It, with your DesignSafe account, uh, you are able to log in and use these resources at no cost to you. So uh, moving on to the next question, how many computer cores does your laptop or desktop have? 21% um, of you said two, 37% said four, and 42% said that you have eight cores on your local machine. In comparison, question five is asking how many cores can you use at DesignSafe? And the answer is if you run a large job, you have access to more than 139,000 cores. So if you're running large jobs that are requiring um, lots of uh, random variables then you should be running on these 
a high performance computer that's available at no charge to you, like we just went over. And the last question is, uh, whose allocation do you use when, run, when running the Sim Center applications? And your options were my own, my own allocation that comes with a, and that was supposed to be design safe account. And 47% of people think they're using their own des design safe allocation. 5% said that they're using the Sim Center allocation and 47% 47 said that they're using the Sim Center allocation and they know how to cite the Sim Center software and design safe in their publications. And that is the right answer. Uh, a little bit of a tricky question. For a limited time, we're offering the Sim Center's use or Sim Center's allocation for you to use when you download and run your jobs at Design Safe using Sim Center apps. So you are uh, using the Sim Center app allocation. You aren't getting ch charged any of your own user allocation at Design Safe. And at some point, that offer may go away. But as it stands now, you are able to use the applications um, and use those for your research running on our allocation at Design Safe. So those were a couple of tricky questions, but I hope I cleared, uh, cleared up some of those um, questions or concerns you might have. And I see in the chat window now um, a question about whether we support Linux. Um, and I think the question is, will we support Linux at some point? Is it possible to uh, is it possible or advisable to compile from from source on Linux? And maybe Songwe or Akash, if you could answer those questions. Um, I think Frank can provide a better answer. Is Frank there? Yeah, let's. So we do compile it on Linux. Um, we just don't release it under Linux. If you have a Linux machine. Um, Basically, you want to install Qt, and then if you download the source code repository, in the source code repository, there's a file called appbear. Actually, there's a make exe.sh, um, and it's pretty much just invoking make exe.sh to, um, to build the tool. But there are instructions on the tool web pages for building QuoFem um, from the source code. So that so what I just described will show you how to build the um, build quote So again, download the source code, have a look at the instructions um, on the web page. There's a makeexe.sh, which is a bash script you can run then to, to build it. You'll see that, that if you open up that bash script, you'll see that it's invoking things such as Conan. Um, and for inst when you install Conan, it's, it's assuming other stuff. But that's all described on the in the documentation on how to build it, which is in the developer section. Great, thank you, Frank. This concludes the SimCenter training in uncertainty quantification using the QuoFem application. Thank you to Song Ri and Akash for covering these advanced topics today, and for uh, answering the attendees' questions. If you have other questions, please join the Sim Center forum and post your feature requests or ask your questions or report problems uh, there. Uh, if you uh, want to stay in touch with us, you can join the Sim Center newsletter, uh, you, which you can subscribe to from our webpage, which is simcenter.designsafe-ci.org. Uh, that's the best way to learn about upcoming events, such as tool trainings, uh, office hours, and uh, other uh, notifications about software releases. Thank you for attending, and this concludes day two of our QuoFem application training. Thank you for attending.